Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for participating in the online Synology for tonight. This is Chang Hui Ling, postdoctoral research fellow of Yao Zhong Yi Academy of Synology. It is my great pleasure to be your host of today's events. Please join me in welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Ling Chao. Dr. Ling is an assistant professor of the Department of Chinese and History, City University of Hong Kong. He primarily researches in classical Chinese poetry and art history with a special focus on the Eve period. He is also interested in literature theory and the philosophical investigation of the relationship between text and image. Please re be reminded that Dr. Ling owns the copyright of his lecture. Any downloading, storage, reproduction, or distribution of the lecture without the prior permission of the respective copyright holder is strictly prohibited. Thank you. May I now invite Dr. Lane to begin our today's lecture, Negative Space and the tra Transcendence in Landscape Paintings and Poetry, from Wang Wei to Zhao Meng. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for like uh, having me here uh, to the Rao Zhongyi Institute. And it's my great pleasure and honor. And uh, thank you very much, Yin and Hui Ling, for all the time and efforts you have um, devoted uh, during the uh, preparation period. Um, and thank you all very much for coming and uh, uh, joining me today. Um, I want to uh, share a little bit of my probably still very premature ideas uh, about um, the relationship between painting and uh, uh, poetry. I will first uh, start sharing my PowerPoints. Um, here it is. Okay. And... Um, play view. So let me find out how to start playing this. What no? Sorry. <laughs> uh, slideshow. Okay. All right. Here it is. Okay. As you can see, um, the title of the topic is um, Negative Space and Transcendence in Landscape Paintings and Poetry from Wang Wei to Zhao Menfu. Um, I just use Wang Wei and Zhao Menfu as two sort of uh, examples trying to understand the relationship between poetry and uh, 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 painting. As uh, most people familiar with Chinese culture would uh, uh, immediately think of that Su Shi famously put it that way, uh, one with poetry. In poetry, there's painting. In painting, there's poetry. And uh, what I want to do is um, this this kind of statement become almost like uh, taken for granted uh, in Chinese culture. And I wanted to understand uh, sort of at the go back to its historical moment when such claims were made and to understand uh, the interconnectivity between two different uh, artistic media and also to understand if and what that uh, deeper sort of philosophical kind of uh, ideological um, common ground, the two, two forms of art shares. Okay, so, um, voila. Ah. and as most people who are kind of familiar with Chinese painting would know that uh, negative space, like Fu uh, Kongjian uh, or like Liu Bai in Chinese, right, are oftentimes used uh, in literary painting uh, tradition to depict like clouds and uh, rivers and water body of water, these kind of things without a definitive shape and uh, uh, sort of form. Um, there are kind of two ways of treating uh, painting, uh, sorry, treating uh, water and clouds in painting. To the left, you can see this is a famous example of Ma Yuan's water pictures. It was um, collected in Palace Museum and it was on display in Hong Kong Palace Museum, uh, I think, I guess, a while ago. You can see it used actually uh, very detailed, fine brushworks lines to depict the ripples of the river. But the majority of uh, uh, Chinese landscape paintings, uh, the painters would use like uh, negative space to indicate uh, clouds and rivers as seen in Guoxi's early spring being one of the most um, famous example. And uh, in this talk, I also kind of wanted to, in this paper, in other words, also trying to kind of expand uh, 
sort of the scope of negative space into poetic art as well, because it doesn't, I mean, it naturally, of course, uh, includes all these imageries, like metaphors uh, of like waters and rivers and clouds, these kind of things. But at the same time, I also wanted to sort of indicate that uh, poetic imageries, they have this capacity and they have this uh, sort of need to, to suggest that there's a transcendental meaning um, beyond uh, what languages can can sort of um, say, can verbalize. So there is a, a negative space which is not verbalized in the poem, but only uh, insinuated or sort of pointed to. So this is um, one reason I particularly wanted to use negative space uh, to refer to these uh, images and imageries uh, as in poetry. Some of the questions I kind of hope at least I can partially answer and uh, suggest some uh, 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 solution is that what is the significance of negative space? How can we make negative space significant and meaningful? Because um, we know it's not emptiness, right? It's not emptiness as in the sense that there's nothing there. But instead, I wanted to argue and um, to suggest that the actual meaning of a lot of paintings and poetry actually resides precisely in these negative space. This is what the author, I mean, painter or poet, wanted to direct our attention to sort of uh, direct our interpretive efforts to. And what moves us to read negative space a certain way in a certain context, how to perceive the negative space. Um, sh should we do it from sort of like ontological kind of gazing, or there's uh, another way, as I would suggest later, which is kind of a contextual approach uh, to understanding negative space. And then thirdly, how to depict what is beyond depiction and similarly, how to articulate what is beyond language, which is maybe one of the most fundamental questions I think uh, literary theorists and maybe uh, philosophers of art would be concerned, right? Uh, so what can painting and poetry do? Is there sort of competition between the two media? Um, I mean, these are sort of more general questions in the back of my mind, and uh, I hope uh, my little attempt here would be able to uh, suggest uh, some of the answers. Okay. Um, we would mainly just focus on Wang Wei and Zhao Menfu, but uh, if time allows, maybe we can say a word or two uh, about Guo Xi, because as you can see, I chose these three people, I mean, uh, important intellectuals, um, sort of in this historical lineage and uh, uh, those familiar with Chinese painting history would know that, uh, especially in Dong Qichang's uh, theory, these are sort of the uh, uh, the Nanzong lineage, which I'm going to talk about right now. Okay, so um, in Dong Qichang's theory about uh, different schools of uh, Chinese painting, uh, he sort of used this different division between the Southern and the Northern school in the Chan Buddhism to kind of refer to painting, uh, painting history, history of Chinese uh, uh, literati painting. Um, as you can see here, I'm just gonna read the Chinese and then uh, very briefly uh, mention some key, key passages. She said, Chan Jia Yu Nan Bei Zong Tang Shi Shi Fen, right? It's sort of divided into uh, two schools in the Tang Dynasty. And it's the same thing as in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, the painting are divided into northern and southern schools. And Wang Wei, as he has seen it, become uh, the most important fundamental master of the uh, Nanzong, in other words, the uh, literati painting. And uh, here he said, what Wang Wei sort of introduced and Wang Wei kind of initiated is that so he was saying that the painted rocks and clouds is kind of transcends uh, the heavenly secrets and uh, the, the meanings, the spirits of his brushworks uh, almost understand uh, sort of the secrets of nature. So we can tell, um, even though this is a very brief uh, uh, excerpt from his uh, theory, we can tell that uh, the influence of Wang Wei on Dong Qichang, um, there are two, two sort of major points. First of all, it this kind of Chan Buddhist uh, enlightenment, Chan Buddhist uh, pursuit uh, has a significant uh, importance 
on uh, one way painting and poetry. And another thing is that the most important thing is in painting and in poetry, as a, as a matter of fact, there's this transcendent, there's this pursuit of transcendental knowledge and understanding of nature and the human being, which is embodied in one way's practice. These are why, these are the reasons why uh, Dong Qichang sees him as uh, basically the founder of the like Wen Renhua, right? <clears throat> um, and we know that uh, Wang Wei's uh, position in painting, um, sort of uh, in painting history have changed, has been uh, significantly elevated after um, his death. Um, in his time, I mean, in the Tang Dynasty, basically most people just see him um, as a good painter, but uh, it's not the best. Wu Daozi and the Da Xiao Li Jiangjun, the two uh, general Li's, right? They were regarded as much better painters. But starting from the Wu Dai, uh, the Five Dynasties, and onwards to the uh, Song Dynasty, Wang Wei has been elevated to a much higher place. And here, as we can see in Dong Qichang's theory, become this most important uh, of this entire tradition. And it has very much to do. Uh, I would argue, and uh, uh, um, and I think uh, also uh, the the reception history for Wang Wei's painting and poetry has also shown that his uh, poetic practice has a very uh, important role in elevating his position in painting. And Wang Wei's Wang Chuan Villa series, Wang Chuan Tu or Wang Chuan Shi, uh, the Wang Chuan series, uh, is the example I'm going to examine today, and. Uh, um, just very briefly, first of all, about the original format of the painting, because uh, Wang Chuan Wang Chuan Shi Wang Chuan poetry um, has been preserved in Wang Wei's uh, anthology, and as we know, uh, shortly after Wang Wei's death, uh, his brother uh, presented the entire uh, Wang Wei's uh, oeuvre to the emperor, and it has been then like copied and reprinted. So we have a rather uh, 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 secure idea about how this Wang Wei's anthology would look like uh, ever since his death. But his painting, of course, um, we don't have any uh, generally accepted authentic paintings of Wang Wei uh, available in today's uh, world. And uh, maybe even in much earlier time, uh, all his authentic works are gone. But um, according to some Tang Dynasty uh, records, we would have a rough idea uh, what uh, Wang Wei's painting of Wang Chuan would look like and what its original format would be. So he, as you can see here, Jia Yu Lan Tian Wang Chuan, Hua Wang Chuan Tu, right? And because Wang Wei purchased the villa in Wang Chuan, and then um, this uh, villa later become Qingyuan Temple, Qingyuan Si. So Qingyuan Si Bi Shang Hua Wang Chuan. So all these kind of earlier uh, records suggest that is most likely they were mural paintings uh, in his uh, uh, mountain villa. And that mountain villa was later um, transformed into a temple. And uh, in, the, in the end of the Tang Dynasty, probably even earlier during the uh, Hui Chang reign, right? Because there's a, a, a demolition of all Buddhist structures in, in Hui Chang reign. So probably the original painting were already lost. And in the Northern Song Dynasty, there's a um, sort of a, a copy on paper or silk uh, preserved in uh, the Li family of the Chang'an. And Mi Fu has seen that. And Mi Fu thinks, Mi Fu thought that was the authentic one. So there are two possibilities. I mean, in, the, in Mi Fu's idea, that was the original sort of uh, uh, draft of the mural painting. Um, then, uh, luckily, we have uh, a numerous amount amount of uh, uh, copies of Wang, Wang Wei's Wang Chuan painting. So either after his original maybe draft or after the mural, but uh, throughout uh, the pre-modern time, we have a numerous amount of copies. And uh, the most famous one is uh, the one, the, the copy made on silk by uh, early Song painter uh, Guo Zhongshu. And uh, one of them is now still uh, in the Taipei Palace Museum collection. And uh, it has, Guo Zhongshu's copy has a tremendous influence, not only because it's early, it might be uh, directly off the mural painting or his or Wang Wei's draft, 
but also uh, in 1617, um, in 1617, there were uh, a, a local sort of mayor of Lan Tian Xian, Lan Tian Xian Ling, so Shen Guohua, he asked some a painter to copy that painting, transform that uh, uh, painting on the silk onto a stone, and then engrave the stone, and later on, uh, uh, numbers of um, rubbings were available. And as you can see, uh, in 1711, uh, the important uh, literati painter Wang Yuanqi also made a kind of a colored version uh, based on the original, I mean, roughly the original design of the Wang Chuan painting. So we would have a rough idea of uh, how Wang Chuan painting looked like uh, based on the um, rubbings and uh, historical records. So first of all, it's uh, pretty much sure it should be mural painting, right? And uh, thinking about uh, how mural paintings were oftentimes uh, uh, painted and used, we also get a rough idea that uh, there's a bang ti, there's a small like section title of each part of the painting. Uh, it's not very clear here um, um, in the painting, but you can see, uh, and later we're gonna zoom in and see slightly better, but there's a small uh, title attached to each section of the painting, which corresponds to like the scenery that section was talking about. And uh, which is also in the same time, titles of Wang Wei's uh, uh, Wang Chuan Shi, Wang Chuan poetry. Um, I, my sort of, um, what I'm going to do now is to read uh, the 20, poems in the Wang Chuan collection um, in a way that I believe these 20 poems should be, re should be read as a complete series, should be read as sort of a poetic education, uh, a, a series of process teaching people how to achieve uh, Chan sort of enlightenment by reading all these poems and the original painting as they were painted on the mural and uh, accompanied with the uh, uh, title of the poems, they would be probably also appreciated uh, in, comp in company of the poems. And it's also going to be dedicated as sort of a, a visual aid uh, for the process of achieving enlightenment for it, it, I mean, Wang Wei and other sort of Chan Buddhist uh, practitioners. And uh, such, such sort of way of uh, reimagining uh, Wang Wei's uh, religion, I mean, one way's Wang Chuan painting and Wang Chuan poetry also sort of kind of uh, conforms to the way a lot of mural paintings were understood, Buddhist mural paintings were understood in the Tang Dynasty. I mean, we don't have much uh, 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 works from that time uh, remaining, but uh, luckily in Dunhuang, right, we have a, a huge number and other Buddhist caves, you have a huge number of Buddhist uh, mural paintings as uh, Yu Jing Wang has argued. I mean, even though people uh, sometimes disagree with his identification of, I mean, the Lotus Sutra with that specific uh, cave. But uh, the rough idea is that all these paintings were understood as visual aids and people by sort of looking at them and uh, going to specific uh, sections of the sutras, they would be able to receive this Buddhist meditative education and then eventually become enlightened. And uh, 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 similar ways we can see as also in, in Japanese Buddhist practice that uh, there's like a vid, sort of a visual pilgrimage in order to uh, have this pilgrimage. In other words, go through, cover different areas of space in order to uh, reach to the final destination. In this case, um, Buddhist enlightenment. Um, we, we can see that uh, paintings provide a very significant uh, um, visual aid. So in this sense, uh, this is how I sort of uh, envision Wang Wei's painting and poetry were sort of collaborating together. But um, I'm gonna focus uh, mainly on, on, on poetry, because as I've said, um, it should be closer to um, what, uh, how, Wang, how Wang Wei sort of organized them. Uh, into a series, but this is uh, the P this uh, PowerPoint you are seeing is um, the first line I say saying that's painting from right to left, right twenty sections, 
and then poems, the corresponding poems uh, that uh, that section was uh, uh, depicting. So as you can see, in generally speaking, they are more or less in the same order with just like a few poems sort of moved to another section, or in other words, a few uh, painting sections were moved uh, to to other to another order. And there are two painting. There is one painting that there's uh, no poem available. Painting number three, we can we will see them uh, in detail. And there is one poem that does not have a corresponding painting. But overall, these two match fairly well and uh, uh, comes together as a whole set. Okay. So poem number one. So we're going to start. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try to cover uh, all 20 poems. Uh, let's see if we can. But um, so uh, poetic sort of theorists and historians have long uh, paid attention to Wang Wei's uh, use of imageries, right? I mean, use of like very simple imageries, natural objects uh, to um, to sort of convey what he has perceived as the Chan enlightenment. And for example, I'm just going to mention uh, one like Raphael uh, Stepien, R-A-F-A-L-S-T-E-P-I-E-N. For those who are interested, you can uh, find his paper on JSTOR. And he was talking about uh, how this uh, Chan Buddhist understanding has uh, made Wang Wei's poetry very tranquil and very simple. And uh, then we can find very little Kind of subjective traces of the poet himself in these poems. So the poetry is kind of embodiment of Chan idea of emptiness. Um, I generally agree with that. And but I think uh, the more important thing is it's not simply sort of uh, Wang Wei's embodiment of Chan emptiness in poetic form, but rather it has reflected uh, how Wang Wei come through a theories of things. In, um, namely from sort of uh, solid, uh, maybe positive things to this negative uh, empty space where eventually um, some deeper uh, Buddhist meaning were able to be conveyed to himself and to the reader. Okay, so the first one, and I'm gonna just simply divide uh, I, I'm going to divide this entire series of 20 poems into roughly three groups. The first is uh, from poem number one to number six, in which I argue that Wang Wei was uh, trying to perceive and trying to have a uh, sort of conceptual grasp of the unchangeable kind of ontological being of things in constant transformation. And the poem number seven all the way to poem number 12 uh, he was trying to kind of situate himself into nature. In other words, he was trying to understand the relationship between human beings and the relationship between human beings and nature. Then finally, the, the remaining eight points, 13 all the way to 20, he was um, more or less kind of uh, using a poetic language to embody, to, to articulate uh, the status of uh, Buddhist um, enlightenment. <clears throat> And in that process, negative space, um, again, like images of clouds and rivers and all these kind of things are very important uh, in order to, to, to show that process. And also, again, he was able to tell us how to move from real material world to a more transcendental uh, uh, understanding. Okay, so point number one, uh, English translation is right here. I just want to read the Chinese very briefly. Right. So at the very beginning, he is very much concerned with transformation, with sort of uh, things in constant change, because he was uh, he was uh, actively, consciously comparing old dead things with uh, new growing and things in the future. The past and present, and in other words, future, has been uh, put side to side uh, and uh, trying to sort of highlight this uh, transformation of things and how you would be able to understand that, right? So as, as I mentioned, Wang Wei purchased 
the villa of Song Zhiwen. Song Zhiwen lived from 656 to 712. So this is the old villa of Wang Wei. So even though it's a new home for Wang Wei, it's, a, it's an old building, right? And then this sort of transient uh, human position of things and uh, again, transient sort of uh, human structures like uh, man-made structures, villas are set against this everlasting, more eternal natural background where, I mean, all these trees, uh, they last much longer than human beings and human uh, um, artifacts. But however, uh, even all these old trees, I mean, they gonna wither like here, uh, the willows, right? They're gonna wither. And Wang Wei, he himself knows that he is going to pass and just like Song Zhuwen, had passed, right? I mean, all these, he's, those things in his position at this moment would eventually be passed down to others. So at the very end, I mean, he, first of all, in the first opening sentence, he mentioned this kong, right? Kong is like emptiness, void, or maybe negative space, right? So if we read this, um, because of the kind of nuance of Chinese languages, we can read this in two ways. Uh, when we are trying to translate that into another language, in this case, now what we're doing in English, right? It it's, can be either in vain, right? So he was just sort of kind of saying in a very sympathetic manner, in a very sympathetic tone that these kind of things will be gone and our sort of uh, uh, efforts are all in vain. But if we see it as a more Buddhist sunyata sense, like Buddhist kong, then Kong and Yo, they again uh, form this sharp contrast. And uh, he was very much in this sense then kind of lamenting that our contemplation of emptiness and being, Kong and Yo, uh, might eventually be just in vain. Okay, so at this opening stage, Wang Wei was still kind of um, confused or sort of uh, very much concerned. He has not yet achieved enlightenment, but then had, has shown us what was on his mind and how this entire Buddhist poetic um, educational process embarks on. So poem number two, um, Hua Zigang. Uh, 飞鸟去不穷, 连山复秋色, 上下华子刚, um, it's a very traditional Chinese poetic motif that after seeing natural objects, you're gonna be uh, like human emotions, feelings would be simulated, right? On, on the surface, this is a very classical uh, representation of such uh, poetics, right? He saw this autumn scenery and then he become kind of melancholy. But uh, if we kind of dig closer, you would see that what Wang Wei was feeling kind of complex about and feeling confused about is much more than simply like autumn scenery. First of all, Fei Niao Qi Bu Chong, he, he introduced this kind of visual endlessness. Fei Niao Qi Bu Chong, Lian Shan Fu Qiu Se. So first of all, the, uh, there are an endless line of birds and each proceeding uh, towards a certain direction. And then the later bird would eventually would quickly replace and overtake uh, the position of the previous bird. And then all the mountains, they are connected and all the uh, um, autumn colors, in other words, uh, like um, colorful leaves of the mountains, they are connected. They are repeated after one after another. So there's this visual boundlessness, visual endlessness that are uh, very difficult for uh, 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 one way to entirely grasp because this sensuous, this uh, word, this material word, their appearances, their se, right? In other words, uh, in, in a sort of, a, in a Buddhist sense, their se, their color, their form, their senses are endlessness. It's impossible for the point to exhaust all these. Okay. Um, so that's one thing. It's uh, difficult to understand the nature or the substance or the essence of things by merely looking at their visual appearances. 
point number two. Point number three introduces another difficulty. Uh, this is, by the way, painting section number three, Wang Kou Zhuang, but there's no corresponding uh, poem uh, in the Wang Chuan series. So we're going to move on to painting number four, which is poem number three, uh, Wen Xing Guan. Wen Xing Cai Wei Liang, Xiang Mao Jie Wei Yu, Bu Zhi Dong Yi Yun, Qu Zuo Ren Jian Yu. I believe this is a significant, this is like a, a, a most one of the most important poems in the first six. We When we read this, first of all, Wang Wei is very much like uh, Aristotle. Um, we know the basic philosophy of Aristotle is uh, helomorphism. Uh, in Chinese, uh, it's oftentimes translated into So in other words, uh, everything, every substance have its matter and its form. So uh, in, a, in a simpler way to understand it is that the matter is what consists of the thing and the form is how it's presented, how it's kind of uh, visually uh, presented to the people, how you see its appearances, right? So there's this duality of matter and form. So here, one way, I mean, is very much sort of differentiating between the matter and form of substances, of things in constant transformation and to show us that it can be very difficult to understand. So if we wanted to, as the previous poem suggested, if you wanted to understand things by only looking at its visual appearances, then we would encounter difficulty. And here is also a um, further reason why. Because he said, when this apricot tree is cut into a uh, chunks of blocks of wood, right? Then when you put it in a building, it's going to be the beam. And then all these xiang mao, the reeds, when they are woven, they become a roof. In other words, their matter haven't changed. The tree is still the tree. I mean, the grass is still grass, but they their form has been changed. And moreover, their position, their kind of context. In this case, I use context not, not in a sense that it's like text uh, before, after, around it, but in a sense, the surrounding environment, the, the overall sphere, sort of interpretive sphere of this thing, how this thing was located in this space, then which generates and eventually determines meaning. So in the second half, as you can see, he was complex with one thing. I mean, rain and cloud. Uh, from a modern scientific uh, view, we would know it's simply, I mean, cloud and rain is simply different forms of water, right? But when this clouds are high up in the sky, it's clouds. When this form of water is high up in the sky, it's cloud. But when this comes down uh, closer to the earth, it becomes rain. So when this matter doesn't change, its form changes. And as its form changes, um, the, the identity, in other words, the being, the substance of that thing also changed. And our perception of that thing also changed at the same time. And how it has been determined is its context. It's how, how this thing was kind of, uh, where this thing was situated. When it's put in the house, it's become beam, right? It's when the grass is put on the top of the roof, it becomes the ceiling. And same thing uh, for um, rain and uh, cloud. Okay. So um, with this sort of eti um, epistemological difficulty, Wang Wei goes on and to, again, talk about sort of people in darkness. So Jing Zhu Lin, Tan Luan Yin Kong Qu, Qing Cui Yang Lian Yi, An Ru Shang Shan Ru, Qiao Ren Bu Ke Zhi. We're just gonna focus a little bit on the opening line. Tall and dense, they gleam by the empty river bend. So the river bends, and it's, as we, we would know from like daily experience, that the reflection of things in the river bends gonna be sort of dimmed, it's gonna be blurry, right? And it's a very interesting thing. Again, uh, the use of water here. The water become a media, like a medium. And at the same time, it also become the object of the observation, right? So uh, if we sort of uh, decipher this um, process of gazing deeper, then on the one hand, first of all, uh, in the first sentence, water was used as a medium. So the reflection of the bamboo bamboo grove on the water helps us to gain a picture, 
to gain an image of the bamboos. By looking at that picture, we are able to understand and at least conceptualize bamboos. At the same time, in the second sentence, Qing Cui Yang Nian Yi, it's such an instant moment, and then quickly uh, this ripples, this water medium, become uh, object observation again. It's it's become like greenish water, right? Azure green, uh, flowing waves. They become greenish waves simply because uh, this forest reflection on the water. So otherwise, uh, empty, void uh, water now become sort of uh, a green ripple, green waves, which is a more concrete thing uh, for observation. So we have this transformation from medium now to substance. And uh, this is a subtle moment. Once these two things merge, just like this uh, wood color, once he merges into this surrounding mountain, we wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able, sorry, we wouldn't be able to identify him. So uh, this is a sort of uh, a conceptual obstacle that human beings needed to overcome, needed to uh, sort of overcome with the help of uh, concentrated meditation. And here goes how one way sort of solve this problem or uh, tries to solve this problem. So point number five, one of the most fam famous one, deer enclosure, right? Here, this is a picture of emptiness painted with language. We can uh, sort of say that, right? Um, he opens with Kong Shan Bu Jian Ren. So there is no man in it, but you, you do not have any visual contact of this human being. The only way for you to understand, in other words, trying to see darkness, trying to see something that you cannot see is by its effects. It has sort of influenced this out like con contextual beings. So in this case, uh, the poet was trying to understand the human presence with the help of language, with the help of sound phenomena. Okay. Um, then let's move on to, so in other words, when you cannot see something, when you have to find meaning of some negative space, you turn your gaze, you turn your emphasis, you, you turn your emphasis onto surrounding things. Okay. Then uh, next point, this is very much uh, a very similar uh, picture Wang Wei uh, has uh, talked about. Uh, in poem number two, right? Feinyao Chibu Chuan, that one. Um, in order to understand, but in poem number two, all these things are continuous. And Lian Shan Fu you cannot see the clear boundaries. But here, with constant and uh, conscious human sort of gazing, human meditation, you are able to basically froze, basically freeze a very significant, uh, sorry, a single moment and capture maybe a mental picture of a certain thing, right? So here, Cai uh, Cui, Shi Fen Ming. So at times they are distinct and clear. And here, Fei Niao Zhu Qian Yu, as I was saying, uh, the bird would occupy the previous bird's position, but uh, in, in terms of their idea in terms of their concept they are basically the same thing even though they're two different birds but they are they belong to the same uh, species they are more or less the same thing but now he was able to sort of divide the continuous picture into sections where you can see birds in the front and the word and you can see the birds following right okay so these are the first six poems he was trying to understand how sort of meditative uh, efforts should be made in order to uh, turn a continuous image into sections and eventually be able to understand it. And when it's not clear, when it's in a negative space, you need to go to surrounding areas. You need to go to its context. There's, instead of gazing, there's this kind of experiencing its uh, a surrounding environment that eventually gives you a idea of what that thing you couldn't see might be. Like again in Mulan Chai, uh, sorry, in, in Lu Chai. Okay. 
Um, poem number seven. 啊，结石红雪绿，复如花更开。山中倘有客，至此芙蓉杯。嗯、um, ，here, as I said earlier, from six to seventeen, Wang Wei was, uh, more or less now thinking about the relationship between human beings, within human beings, and between human beings and nature. So the first one, how can we sort of differentiate between subjectivity and objectivity? Right. I mean, you have this I and others. Here, he was very carefully and、uh, ingeniously sort of uh, uh, reshaping this objectivity and subjectivity by embedding the human presence into natural、uh, environment. So,、um, on the one hand, I mean, as this poem suggests, he was preparing some cups in order to to to、uh, welcome some guests, right? So, as we can see here, Wang Wei was the one who he is the host. He was preparing the cups, and、uh, the guest, maybe a learned monk, maybe a learned scholar,、uh, would be、uh, someone receives、uh, his treatment, right? But he put it in a way as if both the host and the guest were guests of nature, right? And the cup he uses is not a cup, sort of,、uh, with a lot of、uh, human craftsmanship. It's basically just. Uh, using this、uh, bud of this flower of this uh, uh, dogwood flower、uh, to sort of entertain himself and the guest. So in this way, both Wang Wei and the guest becomes the guest of nature, become the guest of the mountain. And、uh, I also wanted to mention here very briefly、uh, the entire Wang、uh, Wang Chuan. Uh, collection, um, each each of the twenty poems were accompanied by Pei Du, um, sorry, by Pei Di's、uh, corresponding poetry. Pei Di is a close friend of Wang Wei, and uh, uh, we can imagine that they were probably、uh, living together for a short period of time. So Pei Di was staying with Wang Wei in Wang Chuan Villa, and as they go through the mountain landscape, they wrote corresponding poems together. But here, from this poem. We get a sense that there were no guests there, right? So I think this is another reason we shouldn't read, as most people would do. We shouldn't read these poems as just kind of like almost like poetic diaries of their like travel log in these mountains, but instead, it's a sort of carefully manipulated,、uh, designed series which reflects his、um, sort of progress in in, light, in Buddhist enlightenment. Okay. We're gonna skip forward a little bit because I、uh, haven't even got to、uh, Zhang Menfu.、Uh, let's go to poem eleven here. Ah,、uh, 吹箫临吉浦，日暮送夫君。湖上一回首，青山卷白云。I was, I mean, in poem number eight and number nine, ah,、uh, and even number ten. Ah,、uh, let's just briefly at number ten. We would see that Wang Wei find difficulty of understanding the presence of other human beings. 隔浦望人家，遥遥不相识。Separated by a vast body of water, you would not, you wouldn't be able to understand、uh, the other human beings. But、uh, how can we eventually transcend this? Again, we using a very linguistic, in a sense, it's sound using sound phenomena to transcend sound phenomena. So this is、uh, what I wanted to kind of emphasize as understanding negative space. How we using solid. Using a, a, a solid space, using positive space, eventually to go beyond that.、Uh, so transcendence of self,、um, in the sense, both poetry writing and sort of、uh, language, and also、uh, on a lower level like、uh, Buddhist understanding. Okay, so here、uh, the ling, we might understand this as like lingering and sort of hover across transcends, right? So it. It sort of、uh, fills the entire negative space of water body. The sound is lingering there. At the end of the day, 日暮 in other words, when temporality stops, right? The human beings were sent away, and now we also see that、um, the entire uh, visual uh, form of natural landscape also reaches its border, 零吉普 So. Uh, in terms of time and space, it both reaches its end, 
and the human beings recedes out of the current pictorial frame. Only sound lingers. In other words, language, sound, kind of a humanly、um, arranged sound, overtakes everything. Overtakes the entire being. Everything has been transformed into linguistic being, into a poetic symbol, just as this poem was doing. And how would that be able to、uh, to be possible, right? Because as I was saying, when you、um, if you wanted to use poetry to write about、uh, natural objects, it has been changed into natural natural kind of、uh, sorry have been changed into、uh, poetic symbols, but. Uh, the eventual purpose of this poem is to inviting you to neglect that、uh, poetic aspect and eventually to go to this transcendental understanding of nature, transcendental understanding of human being. How would that be possible? I mean,、um, within the、uh, very specific case of Chinese language, I think there are two sort of possible ways. I mean, in a more general linguistic. Practice, we would say, it very much re relies on the arbitrariness of the naming and referring. In other words, there doesn't necessarily have to be resemblance between、uh, the thing refer referred to and how you refer to that, right? But in a Chinese text, there's another, maybe other two ways, sort of uh, um, make this possible. On the one hand, is like very. Uh, I I believe、uh, most of us are kind of familiar with this、uh, classical idea that how Chinese pictographs like Xiang Xing Wenzi were created, right? Yang Zhe, Guan Xiang Yu Tian, Fu Zhe, Cha Fa Yu Di. So how you observe the patterns of the heaven and patterns of the、uh, earth and animals, then you created this language. So in this process,、um, there is kind of embedded resemblance. So、uh, linguistic symbols, characters、uh, would have. Uh, more or less a very naive referential、uh, pointing towards natural things, and in this process, even though language is a human product, you can more or less remove human presence by understanding this as a like 圣人书而不作 right? People only、uh, convey; we do not create. That's one thing, and、uh, another thing is here, as you can see, the linguistic. Um, or maybe the the sound aspect of language, the sound aspect, the kind of musicality of language, overcomes visuality of language. In in other words, eventually, um, um, you are able to uh operate in two different uh ways. I I believe these are the two things why we are sort of able to. It's kind of like philosophical and linguistic foundation why 诗中有画，画中有诗 would be possible, uh, within uh Ch Chinese tradition, and this very much also uh conforms to uh the Chan Buddhist idea of 空即是色，色即是空 right? Um, like uh Nagarjuna uh Long Shu in Chinese, he wrote. 不生亦不灭，不长亦不短，不移亦不易，不来亦不出。So form and emptiness find like they were eventually able to be combined together.、Um, quickly running out of time,、um, let me just talk one more point. Then we very briefly look at Chang Menfu. Poem number seventeen. It's a very similar scenario, like、uh, Lu Chai, right? In Lu Chai, is 空山人不知 right? That one.、Um, here we can see the poet was sitting in Yu Huang in the darkness. In the Lu Chai, in the deer enclosure,、uh, go back very briefly, take a look at it. 空山不见人，但无人一响，梵音如声铃，复照青苔上。Uh, The poet was still in a sort of enlightened position, in a place where light was shed on him. But in poem seventeen, now he was sitting in darkness, 独坐幽篁里 So now, in order to understand that, you have to see in the darkness, basically.、Uh, and on the other hand, I also wanted to、uh, call our attention to that he was sitting in this、uh, bamboo lodge. Um, all these kind of mountain lodges, they are made out of bamboo. They are made out of wood. So even though you were sitting in this uh, uh,、um, man-made structure, because of kind of naturalistic aesthetic of Chinese、uh, traditional Chinese 
uh, architecture, you are very much also still just sitting in, in nature, right? Now, again, since vision is not helping, you have to experience it's like external, it's outside, it's surrounding environment in order to gain some knowledge of what it is in the middle, in the darkness. So again, have to reply, depend on sound, depend on uh, music, right? I, I just wanted to say there's a high possibility in this poem. And I mean, in this poem, we know someone's performing, right? But in the previous poem number five, there's a high possibility there were even no people there. It's simply like Tianlai. I think there's a rich body of uh, literature in uh, Waiting Nanbei Chao. People talks about uh, the difference and uh, similarity and the correlation between Tianlai, like Renlai, and like music, music, language, and like natural sound. Okay. But here, uh, the last two the last two lines, 生灵人不知明月来相照, because of the sort of ambiguity of Chinese uh, syntax, there are actually three ways to understand this poem. Um, so first of all, this poet, I mean, this person, he was sitting in this very deep forest and he doesn't know that the moonlight has penetrated the forest because probably the reflective light of moon was not strong enough to penetrate the dense forest for um dense forest that's one way in another way in the bamboo grove here only mean where he was doesn't indicate any sort of obstacles right as in the previous way of understanding that and he is now just lost in meditation therefore he doesn't even pay attention to whether or not the moonlight was shedding on him. And then another way is Shenling Ren is Ren Shenling. So that person, he was lost in meditation, or because of his meditation, he was able to overcome sort of uh, um, epistemological obstacles here, um, sort of symbolized with uh, Shenling, with the forest. And then since that obstacle has been removed, then the moonlight comes and sheds light on him. I mean, we don't need to sort of pick one out of the three. And it's uh, very much likely. I think it's the case that Wang Wei uh, actively used this kind of ambiguity and nuance of Chinese syntax in order to create this sense that subjectivity and objectivity, right? The ontology and its context, uh, the emptiness and the, vo uh, and, uh, the solid, and the observer and the observee, all these things kind of blend together. And then you become you come back to this moment of enlightenment uh, indicated with um sort of depicted with this uh, moonlight shedding on you, so that uh, eventually you come to this uh, state of total enlightenment. Okay. Um I quickly go through uh I think most of the poems, and the key point is that it shows how to understand negative space. And I believe that is important because, uh, I mean, now when we look at uh, uh, paintings, we also tend to uh, uh, be able to understand there's a transcendental meaning. But uh, if we go back and think about uh, how landscape painting first come into uh, its today's shape and how they were understood in one way's time, we would know why one way is such important because of the serious poems depicting and sort of telling us how to go through a journey in, in, in solid things, eventually to reach to this empty space, which is an embodiment and an invitation to understanding transcendental like uh, 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 ideas. Then when we are looking at Wang Chuan paintings, we would go through a very similar thing and such kind of uh, mental process, such kind of poetic interpretive uh, mode would be transplanted and would be applied onto painting. And then gradually later, uh, after, I mean, Song Dynasty and Yuan Dynasty, gradually this kind of form of understanding poems uh, were eventually kind of uh, uh, stabilized. And now I would just very quickly um, go to Zhao Menfu and uh, see how Zhao Menfu has played an important role uh, in this process. And uh, we, we are just gonna look at two paintings no time for the, all the background, but uh, Ha Chiu Tu is uh, one of Zhang Menfu's most famous work, right? He went to Qizhou and 
uh, Zhao Menfu went to the north and he was in Qizhou. So he was able to see the natural views of that state. Then he painted, then he came back and met his friend Gong Jingfu, which is Zhou Mi. So Zhou Mi, uh, Zhou Gong Jing. He was born, I mean, he was from, um, he was from uh, uh, Qizhou, but he never got a chance to visit his hometown. So Zhao Menfu painted this. And it's in a way he wanted to present it to his friend as like today, when we go to travel in some place, we take photos. He wanted to give his friends a very clear idea. And we just focus on how he was painting all these negative space. It's painted with sort of more or less some brush strokes, right? Um, I mean, maybe we can say a little bit more about uh, how this text and image sort of interacts uh, in this painting. Uh, so, we read this inscription here, that's by Zhao Menfu, right? He was saying, So he was saying this Huabuzhu mountain was most significant in this area because he has read it from a uh, book, from like Zuo Zhuan, uh, Zuo commentary, right? So in the one, on the one hand, he was trying to convincing the readers, I mean, the, the viewers and his friend that this is a very frontal sort of tracing of the natural scenery of that area. But at the same time, uh, how he sees that area was very much modified, was very much determined by his reading in classics. So without this uh, understanding of the history, he wouldn't be able to see and paint in this way. So even though these two mountains are more or less just parallel and juxtaposed, but uh, this mountain, because of its visual form, is slightly more noticeable, right? Um, and also we would see here, uh, he was saying, nai wei zi, nai wei zi tu. and we know that's the very purpose of making this picture is trying to make this picture. He was not trying to convey some sort of, uh, um, was not trying to convey any sort of transcendental understanding, but instead it's just this frontal, represent frontal presentation, representation. In other words, we can see this as a visual tracing of the real object, right, for his friend. Okay. Um, and again, you can see here in the rivers, he added some uh, plants and all these things to suggest they are not really empty. It's like real landscape, right? It's not a place for transcendental, it's not kind of inviting people to have, uh, to engage in transcendental uh, thinkings. On the other hand, uh, is a very different story. So, uh, it was not intended to be frontal traces, as I was saying. It's not here, obviously, it's not trying to be a very, uh, very similitude uh, kind of depiction of the actual landscape. But instead, I would say this is a painting of dualism, right, in terms of both Chinese landscape tradition and the Taoist philosophy. So we can see the entire opposition was composed of lines. I mean, even this continuum of mountains, when you kind of view it afar, can visually resemble a very fine cursive line, right? You can see this entire mountains as if it's a cursive line. So this 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 entire composition is basically lines and negative space, right? And the mountains were represented with simple lines and plain color, and the mountains were solid, filled with color, while the waters were void, empty space. And we can see that the te techniques are both archaic and sort of contemporary. It is archaic in a sense, uh, these ways of drawing the contour lines of the mountain and the adding of the Qinglu uh, very much goes back to the Tang tradition. But the entire purpose of this point, uh, sorry, of this painting is expressive. It's a very contemporary Yuan sort of literati painting. Okay. And you can see that the two kind of, uh, the very refined, thin stripe of solid mountain rocks running across the middle of the scroll, outlining archaic and filled with washers of different shades of monochromic green color can be seen as negative space created by the flanking river and sky. Because, um, I mean, the negative space and the, the solid mountains pretty much occupy, I mean, visually, 
um, both occupy a rather significant part of the 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 the, the picture. So we can almost see these mountains, and also the mountains they were empty in a sense in middle, right? I mean the contour line is solid, but in the middle is just light um, wash of green color. So the picture directs the viewer's attention to the mountains. If we notice the vast emptiness first, or then to the negative space if mountains first. In other words, you cannot see only one thing. It sort of com compels you to see the opposite part of the painting. When you see the mountain, you have to notice the river and the sky. When you see the river and sky, it then creates this uh, idea that there were mountain in between. So uh, very much similar to uh, the mode of understanding, as I was saying in, in Wang, Wang Wei's Wang Chuan poetry, how you understand uh, the thing kind of hiding in darkness in the middle by experiencing its uh, surrounding elements. Okay, and uh, we can see this uh, uh, Zhao Menfu's colophon. He said, Wu Xing Shan Shui Qing Yuan, Fei Fu Yu Ran, Du Wang Yu Hui Yu Xing Zhe, Bu Yi Wei Zhi Yan, Nan Lai Zhi Shui Chu Tian Mu Zhi Yang, Zhi Chen Nan San Li Ar Jing, Hui Wei Yu Hu, Wang Wang Che Bai Qing, Yu Hu Zhi Shang Yu Shan, Tong Tong Zhuang Ruo Che Gai Zhe, Yue Che Gai Shan, Gai Che Gai Er Xi, Shan Yi Gao, Yue Dao Chang, Zi Ci Yi Wang, Ben Teng Xiang Zhu, Fu Ke Shen Tu Yi, Chun Ri, Chun Qiu Jia Ri, Xiao Zhou, Yi Liu Chen Nan, Zhong Shan Huan Zhou, Ru Cui Yi Zhuo Xiao, Kong Fu Shui Shang, Yu Chuan Di Yang, Dong Ting Zhu Shan, Cang Ran Ke Jian, Shi Qi Zui, Qing Yuan Chu Ye. From this, uh, the English translation there, from this uh, colophon, we would uh, uh, know, right, the purpose of this painting is inviting you to understand this abstract concept of Qing Yuan. So he was trying to paint a picture of a very abstract idea, a very abstract term, Qing Yuan, uh, clear and distant. And the opening line here, Fei Fu Yu Ran Du Wang Yu Hui Yu Xing Zhe, kind of reflects Zhao Menfu's understanding about nature, picture, and language. So Zhao Qu choose the verb to meet, to come together, Hui, to describe the interaction between human mind and nature. He is sort of implying that there were two independent versions of the landscape, the natural material world and the internal mindscape, right? And as you can often acquire through studying classics, studying poetry, and then the two should resonate and correspond. The result of the negotiation between these two words was painting in this case. But if it's a writer, then it's uh, poetry, right? So one only truly knows the saying, zhi yan, after he has matched his acquired knowledge with the natural phenomena. So more in this case, Zhao Menfu was not simply transporting the real landscape from nature onto paper, as he was doing in Qie Hua Qiu Se Tu. But instead, he was being one who had learned about the nat natural view on books and experienced it in person. Then he was just using this painting to illustrate the abstract con concept distant and clear. So therefore, it's a painting inviting sort of transcendental uh, understanding of things. Sorry. Okay. Um, and the purpose of this painting and observing the nature according to Zhao Menfu's inscription is to go through a process of self-education, right? To understand the clearness and distantness. At the same time, Zhao Menfu was also acknowledging sort of the comparative advantage of language over image, which is that language includes non-imagistic terms to denote, to denote abstract con concepts such as clear and distant. So while in painting, this, these kind of uh, abstract concepts cannot be sort of uh, uh, visually uh, represented, but instead, um, how can we eventually be able to convey that idea in painting? Then you very much have to rely on this process as I was indicating in one way's case, and probably John Menf have benefited from, is that you go through this poetic process of how you can see void and empty things uh, through observing its surrounding uh, solid things. I believe this is um, uh, what uh, painters learn from uh, John Menf, sorry, uh, one way's case, and this is also uh, what is um, 
basically the foundation kind of interconnectivity of Shi Zhong Yu Hua, Hua Zhong Yu Shi. And there's one, one more line, um, a small detail I wanted to point out uh, before um, I finish this talk is that here you can see Ben Teng Xiang Zhu Fu Ke Shen Tu Ye, right? Here is a very similar lament uh, as Wang Wei was talking about uh, in his uh, Wang Chuan Shi. He was not able to sort of differentiate between the boundlessness continuum of visual appearances of things. In order to understand that, uh, poets should have to sort of select uh, specific things. And here in painting, the, the painters have to make choices and uh, present such a design. Eventually, people would be able to be invited and be uh, sort of uh, uh, um, compelled to pay attention to the uh, empty space instead of the only void. Or in other words, kind of seeing this as a paint, as a uh, program of dualism, right? So it's void and empty at the same time. And the, the mountains is uh, solid, but it can also be understood as negative space of mountains. And of course, mountains and uh, rivers were also were always regarded as negative space okay so um i hope um i mean i was trying to squeeze quite a lot of things into uh, an hour and i hope i more or less conveyed uh some of the uh, key thoughts that i've been thinking about and thank you all very much for listening and uh um as i said i welcome all sorts of uh, comments criticism uh, questions suggestions and uh, thank you very much again Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your sharing and your insights, Dr. Lin. Now we come to Q&A section. We welcome your question in both English and Mandarin. Of course, you may also leave your question at chat box. Now we can also ask Chinese questions. Lin, I saw in the chat box there was a question. Yeah. Chat box there was a question. It asked about the black paper in the chat box. 呃，是哪里的？嗯嗯，就嗯，就是说，嗯，那个踏片是呃，哎，我要不还是 share 一下啊？哎，那么嘛，嗯，那个哦，那我还是 share 一下好了。嗯 ，share screen。这个我踏片，我前面有简单的提到，说是一六一七年时候啊、呃，就是沈国华他的课时。然后刻画画画上去，然后找人刻，刻了以后做了很多踏片，然后这些踏片，呃，现公司收藏都很多。然后美国像呃，就就 Princeton 就有一个呃，就有这么一个踏片，然后那个图片就是 Princeton Museum 的那个图片里面截的，然后这里面一段一段就是放大了以后可以呃截出来这个具体的呃踏片。嗯，好的，谢谢。我刚刚还看到有一个同学是举手。嗯我不确定是不是人大的余明老师，呃，那我先解除一下你的静音，还是你你也可以直接在就是 chat 上打出来。好，那么请呃，请需要提问的老师或同学可以直接在 chat box 上打出来。然后林老师，我有我有几个问题想问你，就是你刚才在举王威例子的时候，我很好奇，就是。呃，我们现在有多少关于他的译文？就是因为，就是译文的话，会不会对你的这些讨论有什么影响？你说王王维的翻译，还是说诗,诗歌的这些译文？比如说，他不同的字、不同的版本、不同字等等。嗯，因为嗯，其实嗯呃，网传诗二十首还还算好，就是基本上就呃，大家都用的是那，我想恐怕都是中华数据出的那个。呃，陈铁明老师他的那个教注的那个王维集，然后呃，在点教里面稍微有呃，可能有一些字，有一些译文，但是其实呃，对整个的呃诗意的影响，我觉得呃呃，区别并不是特别特别特别大，因为呃，至少我今天 like 呃、uh, ，for the purpose of myself right， 就是呃。Um, for today's talk, it's not that significant because the way I see all these images, how they were kind of arranged together, how they are、uh, sort of put together, it's、uh, a very much a conceptual process. It's not、uh, necessarily, I mean, and, and also in Wang Wei's poems, 
uh, in many of his poems, uh, like uh, Shan Shui Shi Dang Zhong, uh, it's very clear. Uh, it's not very clear. It's a very kind of a significant one-way trademarkish thing that he puts uh, a lot of objects together just there, as if they are just sort of very seen, like right in front of your eyes. And I I wanted to because um, we didn't have enough time. But as we can see, towards the second half, towards the end of the poems, like um, Bai Yun, uh, sorry, Bai Yun Yi Hui Shou, right? Ah, uh, sorry, um, Bai Yun Juan Qing Shan, right? Hu Shang Yi Hui Shou, Bai Yun Qing Shan Juan Bai Yun, and all these uh, other things. Uh, one of the most, hold on, let me read it. One of the most significant example is. Xing Yi Wu, right? Mu Mo Fu Rong Hua Shan Zhong Fa Hong Er, Jian Hu Ji Wu Ren Fen Fen Kai Qie Luo. So he was able to almost remove like authorial presence, human presence, and things are just there as they are in nature. So the way he writes about it, and I mean, as long as you can see this compilation of uh, images, right, then you would be able to understand what kind of uh, uh, he was trying to 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 convey. So. I uh, I didn't find any sort of variants uh, crucial uh, for this purpose um, because I was trying to understand how this again seeing all these uh, linguistic symbols as a reference reference to natural objects and how eventually all these natural objects collectively contribute to a process that you need to overcome all these so um, for that purpose uh, the variants didn't. Uh, uh, in other words, bother me maybe uh, that much. Um, and uh, also in Wang Chuanji, it's not, uh, there's not huge amount of uh, variants. Um, then, uh, let me just first quickly answer these two more technical things. Uh, yeah, you just go to Princeton Museum, uh, Princeton and then you find that. And then, in Chicago, um, Chicago Institute of Fine Arts, 好像也有这个塔片，也可以找到。呃，就因为欧美的呃 uh, uh, several uh, American uh, libraries and university um, galleries and museums have uh, these painting, uh, sorry, these rubbings, and they usually have very good uh, images. 然后刚才的那个呃诗文，呃的音译的来源，呃 uh, I I mean. I translated them, but uh, there are two. I mean, actually, very recently, uh, if you go to, um, uh, you just find there's a very new recent, a very recent um, one-way translation. I I think it's uh, translated, maybe it's a collaboration between two scholars, uh, two American scholars. Uh, I, let me just quick, very quickly Google, and I can uh, remember the name. I think Versano, maybe. Uh, It's published by De Gruyter, and uh, it's oh yeah, translated by uh, Paul Rouser. That's the most latest uh, version, and uh, uh, I think it just came out last year. And before that, uh, another authentic sort of, I mean, authoritative translation is by uh, um, Yu Baolin. Pauling Yu, Pauling Yu had this uh, poetry of Wang Wei. So uh, when I was uh, translating, I referred to her translation and of course with my own uh, modifications, but overall these are the two uh, now sort of uh, widely accepted and used uh, translations of Wang Wei's uh, poetry in English. And uh, we, and if you you can find there's actually, for example, Lu Chai, it's so famous and we know uh, uh, Octavio Paz also had a, a Spanish translation and uh, in English there are uh, easily over 30 uh, different English versions available, and uh, um, but that's one specific. But uh, Pauling Yu and uh, Paul Rouser, uh, these are the two uh, versions. I mean, Paul Rouser being the most recent, and uh, Pauling Yu says uh, earlier. I will just uh, type the name here in case someone wanted to search. Yeah, uh, then let's go back to that uh, less uh, technical. Let me see. 
。好，赵孟頫的古意是来源于王维还是魏晋南北朝？他们文人画是否一脉 ？OK， 啊、uh, ，This is a very interesting thing. Um, first of all, I mean, it's very hard to find uh, uh, paintings of like mean, from Wang Wei's uh, own hands, right? Um, when we say Wang Wei, uh, sorry, Zhang Menfu 的那些古意的话 probably we are referring to this Qing Lu and the mo one of the most uh kind of iconic example when we talk about Wang Wei. No, sorry, Zhang Menfu's um archaism is Xie You Yu, uh, Qiu He Tu. That's also preserved in, um, in Princeton Museum. Um, then that's again it's a Qing Lu Shan Shui's tool, and then uh, there's Xie You Yu sitting uh, in a grove and contemplating, and it very much goes back to styles earlier than Wang Wei, like Wei Jing. And Wang Wei actually, I mean, in this case, uh, Wang Wei should be seen, even though we don't have exact. Idea what Wang Wei's painting would look like, but there, based on the uh, the records, Wang Wei might be someone who's kind of innovative in a sense in the Tang Dynasty because we know, uh, Tang Yiqian's Shan Shui Hua, right? I mean, on the one hand, it's Qing Lu Wei Zhu, and also at the even earlier stages, usually background of uh, uh, 人物画 like paintings of uh, people, um, uh, and portraits, and uh, early example, um. Mishu Zhen Tu, right? I mean, a mountain. So it's oftentimes you used with like a, a contour line. Just use a brushwork to draw a contour line, and then filled with color, just like uh, uh, this um, Wu Xing Qing Yuan Tu. By the way, Wu Xing Qing Yuan Tu. Some people still argue that might not be uh, from uh, Zhang Menfu's original, but even if it's not, it should be a. a, 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 a Reliable copy. So again, for the purpose of my work, uh, authenticity in this case is not that important. So for so so Zhao Menfu's Gu Yi probably is from Wei Jing Nanbei Chao, but their Wen Ren Hua is否一脉 Um, this needed to be understood. I mean, in in Dong Qichang's kind of reconstruction of this uh, literary painting lineage, uh, we go through this like Wang Wei and then. Uh, Su Shi, uh, Zhao Menfu, all the way to uh, uh, Yuan Sijia, then Ming Sijia, right? Suzhou Wenrenhua. So we go through this uh, tradition. But uh, the pro again, the problem with Zhao Menfu is that um, I, th I think kind of a unique phenomenon of Zhao Menfu is that um, he has such a diverse style. And when we think about uh, Zhao Menfu, we have horse paintings and then more archaic, like Xie You Yu, uh, Qiu He Tu, then also more realistic, uh, Qiu Hua Qiu Se Tu. So um, it seems that uh, a, a whole bunch of labels have been attached to, to, to Zhao Menfu. So Zhao Menfu, if all these paintings are, are, are authentic, then Zhao Menfu would have basically learned from various uh, traditions. And uh, so it's very hard to say that Zhao Menfu has learned only from Wang Wei, right? But uh, my point is that uh, Wang Wei's way of thinking, way of kind of understanding negative space, uh, if we wanted to put it in a more kind of uh, radical way, and then it goes from poetry to Wang Wei's painting, then through that all the way gradually after Song Yuan, gradually into this literary painting tradition. So in some cases, uh, we would even want to say all these paintings the importance is not the mountains, it's rather the negative space. It invites you to have this transcendental uh, understanding and thinking. And um, I skipped Guo Xi. Guo Xi talks about the aesthetic and kind of philosophical value of uh, uh, mountains, sorry, of rivers and uh, clouds in Lin Quan Gaozhi, right, in his uh, 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 treatise, I mean, compiled by his son, edited by his son. Um, but uh, so we have to go through this entire tradition and it's not like they happen at the same time or in a short period of time. It just, there's this sort of common ground which poets and painters, I believe that shared. Okay. And then, uh, did I miss anything? No. Uh, there's another one. Wang Wei 以来南宗山水画对空的表现是否客观上为题画式的发展提供了空间 I, I, that, to be honest, that's uh, what I do tend to believe. 
uh, we know the uh, the practice of Ti Hua Shi goes back to, to much earlier than uh, Ming Qing, right? Um, we began to see some cases in the Song Dynasty, for example, uh, um, poems were written on the back of the fan. And, uh, but um, in Tang Dynasty, we know Du Fu have written uh, Ti Hua Shi. Du Fu, uh, you a famous poem like Hua Ying, right? He was basically saying how uh, um, um, this painted ego, as if it's real, is going to go out and uh, hunt, kind of hunt on other uh, ordinary birds, right? So we know there are Ti Hua Shi and uh, 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 Yu Xing has serious poems, right? Talking about like uh, pain, painted screens, all these kind of things. So there is a long tradition. It's just these poems were not attached to paintings. And uh, I, I was able to only say very briefly when we are talking about Chue Hua Chiu Se Tu, I mean, in order to read Chue Hua Chiu Se Tu, in order to grasp sort of uh, its symbolic meaning, of that painting, you have to read his inscription, um, because um, so in the inscription, there's kind of um, kind of dilemma there. He was saying, "I wanted to paint this just as a bare image to give it to you, so that you know what your hometown looked like for Zhou Mi, right?" But at the same time, he was also kind of indi- I mean, uh, um, Li Zhu Jing in his uh, book about Chiu Hua Chiu Se Tu and other scholars believe that it's also sort of there's this political kind of allegorical reading to it um while this hua bu zhu which stands out so proeminently in the uh, entire image just represents zhou mi being a very capable and talented and uh, um important official right but you wouldn't able to grasp all these without reading that and in particular you wouldn't be able to understand sort of uh um these kind of philosophical uh, uh, directions that the poet slash painter were trying to convey to the readers without having them side by side. And I think uh, uh, at the beginning, I said this uh, Wang Chuan Tu was probably, I mean, was a, in the format of murals and next to each section of the image, there would be a title. And I believe I mean, those who were able to visit would have Wang Wei's poems in hand or in their mind when they are viewing the painting and they would be able to read it. And in the future, uh, another way, I mean, this is very hard to find uh, um, textual evidences, but I would believe when people were looking at the copying or maybe the rubbing of Wang Wei's Wang Chuan paintings, they would memorize Wang Wei's Wang Chuan poetry. And altogether, it's a very similar process as you are going in a Dunhuang cave, looking at all these Buddhist illustrations. Like when we go to, uh, so for example, go to Dunhuang, you will see Jedaka story, Benshin, right? These are stories of Buddha's life. And then next to it, it's gonna say like, Shu uh, Shen Si Hu, right? Ge Ro Wei Ying, these kind of things. And then you would go through all these stories. It's a very uh, multimedia sort of, uh, educational film uh, for the readers. And uh, in this case, they work together. So I think uh, one way in this way of representing, sort of showing space, right? And showing different things, organizing a way in order to go on and continue on a more linguistic, verbal sort of reasoning in order to finally understand uh, the ultimate purpose he was trying to convey in the painting, uh, even though the the poetry and the painting were not already put together in the same on the same uh, piece of paper uh, on the same surface, but in in someone's mind they were already put together. I built, I think it would have something to do with uh, uh, later when uh, intellectuals, literati painters enjoyed so much um you know of adding a poem to to the paintings but again um these kind of things um we cannot say find uh, uh theoretical treatises 
like painters from back that time and telling us why he would have wanted to add this one. But um, I, I think if we see it in this historical development, we can we can uh, sense that uh, that is uh, what was happening. Thank you. I think it's time for us to end up. Thank you once again for Dr. Lee and thank you all of you for joining us today. The next online technology fortnightly will be on 25th November, conducted by Dr. He Weidong, Assistant Professor of National Taiwan Normal University, with topic on Nan Chao Wu Xin Xiang Yu Xin Yang the Xuan Xi Wen Ben Zhi Zu Yu Guo Jia Di Fang Zhi Hu Dong. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.